The Dark Angel by Meredith Ann Pierce, Chapter 13, Change of Heart. When Ariel opened her eyes, all was as it had been a few moments before. The Icarus lay pale and still on his crumpled black wings. The thirteen wraiths stood wan and motionless around him. Ariel arose at last and walked past them to the vampire. She knelt beside him and unfastened the necklace from his throat. His flesh was colorless and cold as death. Her hands were shaking. At first she feared to see him rot and fall to ashes at her touch, but he breathed on, and then she fully expected him to awake from feigned sleep and strangle her, but he did not stir. She lifted the leaden chain in her hands and unhooked the first vial from its link. She turned and held it up. Whose soul is this? she asked. One of the wraiths came forward, perhaps the most bent and wasted of them. It is mine, she said, and her voice was so thin it sounded like a little more than wind. You must help me, the wraith's emaciated fingers closed about Ariel's hand. She helped the creature raise the leaden vessel to her lips, mouth, and drink, to her lipless mouth and drink. For such a tiny vial, it seemed she drank a very long time. When she was done, the wraith stepped back, but she was no longer a wraith. She now had eyes where only hollows had been, and though her body was as starved and fleshless as before, there was now an energy about it, almost a glow. My name is Maria, said the creature, who was no longer a wraith. Her voice was soft and full, very beautiful. I was a daughter of a goose herd in the forested hills of Bern. I was tending my flocks in the meadows one morning when the dark angel seized me. Then, before she had quite spoken the last of it, her body fell away into dust. Her bones crumbled and settled in a heap. Yet still she stood there before Ariel, or rather it was another being that stood in her place, a being made of soft yellow light that retained a human shape. The shift Ariel had woven for her dropped softly about her, but the outline of her form shone faintly through. She looked to Ariel like a beautiful young woman. See me as I was before, the spirit said. Now that you have given me back my soul, I have no more use for my body. My heart and my lifeblood are gone irreplaceably. I am no longer of this world, but I must leave body behind. But this, she touched her kirtle, which you have given me, I will retain. For love is immortal and eternal and will not wither in the endless deeps of heaven. The spirit rose. Her image grew thinner, more transparent, and her soft light diffused. She ascended more swiftly as Ariel watched. Her garment ripped gently in some wind that Ariel could not feel. The spirit receded to the upper reaches of the night sky. Her light grew smaller and farther away until it seemed no more than a fallow star in a dark swatch of the heavens where no other stars burned. Ariel gazed at the now motionless point of light a long moment before she could bring herself back to the task at hand. The other wraiths already were moaning and clamoring for their souls. Ariel gave out the vials one by one, then watched as one by one the mummy, the mummy women drank, and their bodies fell away, leaving only the bright images of their souls. And in turn, each told her name and where she was from, and what she had been in life and how the vampire had taken her. Slowly they ascended. Then Ariel gave the last wraith the little vial but one, then Ariel gave the last wraith the last vial but one, and when the creature drank and her body fell to dust, Ariel recognized the spirit's features, though they were made of golden light. Eodowin, she cried softly, Eodowin. Yes, companion, the spirit told her. The spirit said her voice was lovely, bell-like in tone, but she still recognized Eodowin's. You were my servant once, and I was careless of you even as I was jealous of your fortitude. I have no fortitude, Ariel whispered. The golden maiden smiled. When the Icarus took me, did you not go to avenge me, as a friend would have done and not a slave? I was desperate, she protested softly. I was in despair. Your father would have sold me. But the other spoke on, still smiling. And when you found me, among those others, a wretched mindless wraith, Still you came to us, though we were hideous to look at. You did not know which one I was, and so you loved us all for my sake. Now you have felled the Icarus and returned to us our souls. 
Thirteen stars will burn bright in heaven for you, Ariel. <clears throat> so saying, she rose into the sky. Looking up, Ariel saw fixed stars in the patch of heavens that had formerly been dark. As she watched, that last of the spirits joined the constellation, a perfect tilted circle like a crown or maiden's dancing, save that one spot was empty. That will be my place, thought Ariel, when I depart the world. She looked down at the last empty vial in the leaden chain, and there my soul would have rested had I let the vampire take me. She laid the heavy chain down and gazed at the unconscious dark angel. He lay absolutely still, save for his quiet, shallow breaths. Helpless now and unaware, he looked more pathetic than terrible, more wasted than ugly. Ariel touched the unbleeding and unhealing slashes on his shoulder and cheek. The awful coldness of his flesh numbed her fingertips. A great white light filled the darkened chamber. Ariel spun around. The Duro stood in the doorway with a torch of rushlight in his hand. Ariel wondered how long it had been since sundown. No more than half an hour, surely. Only the time it had taken the Daro to make his way up from the caverns and through the long, twisted halls of the castle into the room. The little man was puffing and blowing when he entered, so she knew he must have hurried. Ariel wondered that she had not heard him coming. Ah, daughter, he panted. I see you are quite well, so perhaps there was not need for all the haste I made. I... He had to pause for breath. I heard a scream. Ariel turned her face away, touched her wrist. He caught hold of me, she murmured, but the wraith saved me. The wraith, the little mage mused. So they proved to be of use at last. And did you not need the dagger, and you did not need the dagger after all? He puffed a sigh, folded his hands, nodded. Well, I am glad. Ariel glanced back at him. Your poison has done its work, she said, surprising herself with the stiffness of her tone. What was it? Poison, snorted the Darrow as he seated himself. Daughter, it was hardly that. It was life, health, warmth. Call it what you will. It was. It is in all plants, in the nectar of horn flowers, in animals, in the dram of, that flows from the wellspring of Aderlon, and infuses all the waters of the world. Even in the dead lake of the Lorelei, there is a little of the water of life. Elsewise, that that mere would be truly dead, devoid even of her nearly dead creatures. Even she is yet a little alive, he indicated the fallen Icarus. As is he, but he is mostly dead, and it is the deadness in him that rejects the vigor of that dram. The Duro took a quiet survey of the room before eyeing the little heaps of ashes on the floor. Well, he said, I see you've done with the vampire's wives. I must say I'm glad to see the last of that lot. All that wailing and moaning one could scarcely think. And here is... The here is the knife, said Ariel. She drew it from behind her bridal gown and lifted the chain from around her neck. She had spoken more to quiet him than from need, for he could plainly for he could plainly see it shining brighter than his torch. The Duro's manner was the same as always, brisk and talkative, but just now it grated on her terribly. It seemed an abomination for him to run so lightly in face of the deed they were about to do, and she knew full well that they must kill the Icarus. A season passed on the steeps of terrain. She had relished the thought, but now it sickened her, for she no longer feared him, nor loathed him, nor worshipped him as she had done before. She felt a curious kind of pity for him now, a pity for his present helplessness, and an almost longing for his former might. He had been terrible and evil, yes, but also very beautiful. Now they were going to destroy him, as he had meant to destroy the wraiths, this world and her, Ariel reminded herself, yet the memory of his beauty haunted her, and she felt suddenly overwhelmed with a sorrow she did not entirely understand. Ariel held out the knife to the mage. You do it, she told him. I cannot. The Daro rose and came over to her, eyed, eyed her quizzically. Daughter, he said, only the children of the upper lands under the sky can wield the, that blade and strike true. It was not made for the hand of a son of, er of earth. Of course, said Ariel softly, I should have known. Bitterness and misery mixed with the pity in her breast as she took the dagger more firmly in her grasp. It seemed to have no weight at all. She closed with both hands around its haft, glanced from the fallen Icarus to her companion. 
give me some word to bolster me in this, she begged him. Plunge the blade into his heart, Nadaro said, and it is done. There was no rancor in his voice, no malice at all. Nonetheless, she was filled with disgust at his words and at herself, for she knew she must obey them. She gazed down at the dark angel. He lay there as still as death. And yet, she knew he lived. She raised the blade above his breast and tried to close her eyes. She knew she could have done it. Had only she shut her eyes, shut out the light of the lamps and the stars and the Duro's torch and the blade, saying, Theodowin, or This is not killing, he is already dead, or This is not the dark angel, it is someone I do not know. But she could neither close her eyes, nor speak, nor move. She held the dagger bright above him for a very long time before she lowered it slowly and laid it on the floor. I cannot, she said at last. She said, I cannot kill him, but you must, the Duro admonished gently, tentatively, almost as if he were testing her. There is nothing that I must do, snapped Ariel more fiercely than she meant. She made her voice a little quieter, but no less firm. I am free to make this choice, and I, cho and I choose. He shall not die. They sat in silence for a very great while. She could not turn to face him, but she knew he was looking at her, studying her. She knew that he had trusted her, depended on her to do this thing. She had even convinced herself that it might be possible, after all, only to discover now, at this moment, she could not. She had failed the merge and herself. One warm tear slid down her cheek, and yet she felt, strangely now, no great sorrow. What then do you propose to do with him? The little man inquired. I... Ariel drew breath, and she was surprised to find it ragged. <gasps> I do not know. I want... She was trying to say something she knew, but was not even sure herself quite what it was. Tell me what you want, her companion said. Ariel bit her lip and touched the fallen Icarus's face. The icy chill of his cheek numbed her hand, and she did not care. The Lorelei has drunk his blood, hardened his heart, she answered softly. He is much her prisoner as the race were his. As I pitied them once, must I not pity him now, my heart? Her breaths were coming in short. Her, her breaths were coming so short she had to pause. My heart goes out to him, I want... She stumbled, sat a moment in silence. I wish that I might save him from the witch, as I have saved the race from him. She turned to face the Duro now, and to her surprise found him eyeing her with the barest trace of a, sm a smile on his lips. She feared he was mocking her. He is monstrous and evil, she cried, despairing. I know it well, but his soul is still his own. There is that final spark of good in him. Her throat felt tighter than she had ever known. She dropped her eyes. He is not quite a vampire yet. The little mage laughed softly, then and Ariel realized it was not mockery, but approval lit his eye. It is that spark, then, daughter, he said, that you must seize and kindle if you are to...